Hello again. Uh, this is Lecture 2 of the Inter Introduction to Radar Systems course, and in this lecture we'll be discussing the radar equation. As I mentioned in the first lecture, at the beginning of each following lecture, we'll bring up and show you the radar system block diagram, and we will give you the context of that individual lecture within that radar system block diagram. Rather than focusing on one individual piece like the transmitters and receivers or the antenna or propagation, this lecture will discuss the radar range equation which connects all of the different pieces of the radar with the target and the distance from the radar to the target. That radar equation, as I just said, connects the target properties, which are the target's reflectivity, or its radar cross-section as we call it, the radar characteristics such as transmitter power and antenna aperture, and the distance between the target and the radar, i.e. the range to the target, and also the properties of the medium the attenu in atmospheric attenuation and that sort of thing. Okay. N first we're going to go over an introduction to the radar equation, then we'll look at uh, the surveillance form of that radar range equation, we'll go over the different losses that can a uh, so-called, I call it the humanity of the radar, the inefficiencies in the different uh, components and subsystems of the radar that contribute to the uh, losses in the radar equation. We'll look in, in detail at an example of uh, the, how the performance of an individual radar example is calculated, um, and then we'll summarize. Okay, now let's start off with uh, deriving the radar range equation. What we're going to do is to go over from basic physical principles how the radar equation uh, evolves. We're going to just need algebra and, and our reasonable good physical intuition. Now let's start where you'd think of with the radar transmitting a pulse in the simplest possible way. Transmitting a spherically symmetric uniform pulse of energy uh, with a given power in that pulse, and it's ra uniformly radiating out spherically. That peak power of that pulse of energy we denote as P sub T, the peak power of the transmitter, and at any distance R away from that transmitter, the density of power is given by the, that peak power divided by the area of the sphere because that density of energy is going to diminish as the sphere gets larger and larger. It's the power per unit area. Okay, If you say you had a small area on the sphere, the power density on a small, at a given point would be the overall power divided by all the area in the sphere. So at a given arbitrary distance from the radar, the power density is that P sub T divided by 4 pi R squared. Now in practical radars, we don't transmit power out in all directions. There's one, uh, it, we use an antenna to shape the beam and send the energy preferentially in one direction. And as we mentioned, it went over in the first lecture, that directivity that we give the, the beam it, it, it is characterized by a quantity we call the gain. And it's the power the gr that you have in excess of the power that you'd have if you were transmitting in an isotropic spherical wave. So let's just slowly reiterate it. The gains, the int radiation intensity of the antenna in a given direction over that that you'd get from a uniformly radiating isotropic source. And that gain 
it can be written out uh, as four, it, 4 pi times the area of the antenna divided by the wavelength squared. I haven't given you a, a derivation or a physically um, intuitive understanding of that. We'll talk about that later in the uh, antenna section. But that gain is that greater amount of energy you'll have over the spherical radiating energy. So if we want to write down the, modify this above expression for the power density of an isotropic antenna, the power density from a directive antenna is just the first expression multiplied by the, the gain of the, of, the, of the transmitter, transmitting antenna, excuse me. Okay, now that, that wave going out towards the target is going to emit out till it gets to the target. And that a power density will impinge on the target. And the radar cross section, which is elect electromagnetically the size of the target, it's the electromagnetic area that the target sees, it's a measure of the energy that is radiated back towards the radar, that's intercepted and scattered and goes back to the radar. And we call that sometimes the RCS. The, for the initials radar cross-section, and it's usually denoted in equations with the Greek symbol sigma, a small sig sigma. And its units are in meters squared, or area. Remember I ca called it an effective area. Now if the power of the reflected signal at the target then would be the power density, which we just had, times that area. Power density times the area will be the power reflected at the target. Now that energy will be reflected back and again will undergo um, a diminishment of 1 over r squared as it, and times 4 pi as that wave expands out so that the power density received at the radar is given by this expression just the power of the reflected signal at the target divided by another factor of the area of the sphere back to the target, 4 pi r squared. And notice that the power density of the reflected signal falls off as 1 over r squared. Now back at the target, the received power is just the power density at the radar which we calculated in the previous view graph, times the area of the receiving antenna. So I'm again multiplying the received power density times the effective area of the antenna. This is A sub B. And this gives us the power of the reflected signal at the radar. Very important factor. So that's the power that's received back at the radar from the echo of the target signal. Okay, now competing with that power of the echo is background noise. Remember we, sh I, we showed you a graph of the noise that the receiver would hear if there was no target, no echo, no transmitter, no nothing. Just turn on the radio, radar receiver, turn up the volume, and there'll be some ambient noise. So what causes that ambient noise that we want to see that very small uh, few microwatts of power in? And there are a number of different physical effects that cause it. Some of it is galactic noise. That's noise that comes from other galaxies that's in the microwave reach frequency range. Uh, noise from the sun in the same, that would be in the same frequency range that you're listening in your radar. Noise that's generated in the atmosphere, lightning, which will generate some energy in, in that spectrum. And uh, I've got a little cartoon here for lightning. Also, there can be man made interference. Interference from other nearby elect electromagnetic sources like radars, radio stations, things like that. Or it could be um, uh, deliberate. Uh, deliberate transmissions to raise the floor noise in the, in the receiver of the radar so that the radar would be ineffective. We call those jammers. Okay.
and, and then noise that could come from lots of different sources reflect off the ground and go in the, the side lobes, the, the places in the antenna that don't have a huge amount of reflectivity, but they all add in together. And then, of course, there's going to be noise that comes from the uh, portions of the receiver and the waveguide till it gets back into the, into the depths of the receiver. Okay. Now, we characterize the noise power as Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, and we have a, a, a bandwidth factor in here. Intuitively, when you have uh, like an atom, it's moving back and forth. It, when you heat it up, it, 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 uh, it, it gains energy. And that amount of energy that it gets by being heated up um, is Boltzmann's constant times the temperature that you heat, heat it up to. Okay? And that's the amount of energy. Now, the power would be the energy per unit time. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to characterize all these different noise sources by an effective temperature that we're going to multiply Boltzmann constant by, but that's an energy, and we have to divide that by a time to get the power. And the time over which we're looking is just the pulse width of the radar, that how the size of the pulse, and one over that is a good is the bandwidth, the, the frequency range over which we're operating, and that the receiver is listening to, and that's that B sub n, and that's measured in hertz. So the effective power of the noise is Boltzmann's constant. It's shown over here. It's a universal constant, and it's measured in energy per degree Kelvin. Now, um, so there's many different sources that the noise can come from. And what we do is we represent them by a single noise source at the output of the antenna terminal. Now, what are we left with in terms of the equations we've developed? We've got the signal power right up here, that's at the, and then we've got the noise power. And the ratio of those two is the signal to noise ratio. So we just take this set of quantities divided by that, and we have this equation right here. Okay. Now the signal to noise ratio, and we call it S slash N or SNR, is the standard measure of a radar's ability to detect a given target at a given range from a radar. And the way we would state that is we'd say the signal to noise ratio of a certain radar is 13 dB, but always we'd say it's on a one square meter target, as an example, at a range of a thousand kilometers. And that statement is a statement of the detecting the detectability characteristics of, of a radar. Notice if I take this equation and I plug in a certain cross section and I plug in a certain range then all the other parameters are the properties of the radar itself innately. Okay. So this, this says that uh, um, is, is a statement of the, de of the ability of a certain radar to detect a one square meter target at a thousand kilometers. Okay. Now I told you about the system noise temperature being the sum of a lot of different characteristics. And this is how one calculates that total system noise temperature. It's divided up into three components. Apart from the antenna, apart from the, that's the contributions from the uh, components in between the antenna and the receiver, and apart in the receiver itself. The contribution from the antenna includes the apparent sky temperature, and you can get that from a standard graph in a radar text. And it depends on the angle you're looking in the sky and the frequency of the, of the radar, that sort of thing. And also it includes uh, uh, heating ohmic losses, so-called ohmic losses, within the antenna itself. Then there's the contribution for the, uh, the microwave components, the so-called radio frequency and microwave components, between the antenna and the receiver. And they're all lumped into one effective temperature. And 
Then there's a, uh, a component for, that, ha that characterizes the actual noise that's innate in the receiver. And there's a, uh, a, a term called the noise factor of the receiver uh, that, that is related to the, to the temperature of, the, of that receiver. I'm not going to put that equation down for simplicity in this course. Later courses we'll go into that detail. But it's effectively the temperature of the receiver and then also the loss uh, of those input microwave components within the receiver. So when you put that all together you'll come out with a certain temperature in degrees Kelvin that you plug in the radar equation. Okay, now we want to go to the surveillance form of the radar equation. And why so much the surveillance radar equation? Because what we've just done is we have derived just previously, and here it is, the radar equation when the location of a target is known and the antenna is pointing towards the target. If you think in that whole set of logic I went through to develop the radar equation, I had the antenna pointing directly at the target. So you might say, well, gee, what if I know the antenna, the uh, target's up in the sky, but I don't know where, and my beam is relatively narrow. I've got to look here, listen, look there, listen, look at another angle, and listen, look at a whole bunch of angular positions uh, that, uh, that might be in a rectangular uh, solid angle or angular area or a horizontal uh, set of beams we call a horizon fence and, and go back and forth looking for targets. And, um, that form of the radar equation is called the surveillance form and it, you have to manipulate uh, this algebraically this to put one in the form of the other. Okay. Now when we do that we come out with this equation on the right. And you can see what we want to do is we want to say for a given radar, one of my parameters of saying how well the radar will work is I have to say how big a volume do I have to, angular volume do I have to search? And that's characterized by a solid angle, which is the angular space I have to keep searching to find the target. And it's also characterized by a term, which is the time it takes to do that. Okay, and, and in this form of the equation, we convert the peak power to the average power through the duty cycle and the time between pulses that we talked about earlier. And, but this is the form of the search equation. Okay, and this is the form of the track equation. So when you could imagine, when you build a radar, you're going to have two different functions. First, I want to search for targets. So you develop a radar that would have an, uh, the appropriate power and aperture and to be able to have sufficient signal-to-noise ratio to perform its search function. But then after you've, you've developed the radar to do that search function, you want to make sure that it can, tra it can perform the track functions you want to uh, have it perform also, and you'd use this form of the radar equation. So when you do the design process in a radar, you're going to use both forms of the radar equation. Now let's look at the search equation for a few minutes in a couple of different view graphs. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll just draw some measure from it about physically intuitive things and trade-offs and just to get, give you a feel for what, what these algebraic quantities mean. Now we can take this algebra up here, which in some sense it isn't. Let's just poke and move over to one side all those parameters which are design parameters of the radar. The power, the aperture of the radar, the uh, system noise temperature, uh, and the losses. They all have to do with what the, how the engineers would build that radar and design it. Then on the other side of the equation, there's a few constants. In one case, I put Boltzmann constants here because that's natural, the sort of with the system noise temperature and the four pi is over here. But the, all the other quantities over here are performance parameters. How big a solid angle can we cover when we do search? How far out can we perform search and range? Um, 
and what's the quality of our measurements, the signal to noise ratio? How much time is required to do that search? And what size targets can we see? These are all performance characteristics. Okay? So you see, on the one hand, you've got the stuff you want, the, the, the requirements you want the radar to do, and on the other hand, you've got the engineering characteristics that the designer has to build. And if you want a certain set of performance parameters, you've got these things at your beck and call that you have to build the radar with enough power, big enough aperture, etc. Excuse me, etc. Now, let's rewrite that equation from its original form of signal to noise ratio is equal to all those parameters to one where we put power on the left, the average power, and everything else on the right. Okay? And let's look and let's see, hey, the power that's required to do the job it's independent of wavelength. You don't see wavelength appearing anywhere in here. Interesting point. But if we brought back the, uh, I'll go back quickly to view graphs, we go to the track equation, the wavelength comes into play. Okay. So we have the power, uh, it's independent of wavelength, and it's a very strong function of R. We'll get into that. But everything else, it's, it's linear in everything else. You know, if you want uh, double your signal to noise ratio, you've got to double your power. If you want a, half the area, you've got to double your power, that sort of thing. Now let's look and see how strong that R to the fourth character, that really makes a big difference. Say we have a radar. It can do its job at a thousand kilometers. It can do search out to a thousand kilometers of range. Well, how do we have to modify that radar to be able to do the same job at two thousand kilometers? Well, this one solution is we can increase to increase the range by a factor of two or 3 dB. I'm going to use this as an example to get you a little more used to using dBs if you're not. I, can, I have to increase the power by a factor of 16. If I double the power from 2 to 4, that range number goes up by a factor of 16, which is 12 dB. So I'd have to increase my power well over a factor of 10 not a hundred, but you know, somewhere in between. Incredible, huge amount. I'd have to increase the, or I could increase the diameter of the antenna by a factor of four, six dB, or the area by 12 dB. Okay, big, you know, well over a factor of 10. Um, or I could increase the time I scan by 12 dB, or, or increase this, or decrease the solid angle that I can see. If I want to see out farther, I can't look at as many different angle cells by a factor of well over a factor of 10. Or I can take pieces out of each one of those. But the thing I want to point, use this to point out is that the radar range equation is a very very strong fact uh, function of the. Uh, very strong function of the of the the power required and the other parameters a very strong function of R.